Before we get to today's show, I came across an interesting article on the Huffington Post about the the pandemic and nostalgia, and I thought maybe I would share it at the top of the show. This is an excerpt from an article entitled, Here's Why You're Reminiscing More Than Usual During the Pandemic. And this article is written by Julia Rise. The pandemic has made life weird, and lockdowns and restrictions are just some of the recent events to have a tremendous effect on the human psyche. A few months ago, tons of people started experiencing wild and vivid coronavirus-themed dreams. As the days passed, many lost their sense of time and stopped caring about whether it was Sunday or Tuesday. Now, people are looking back at their pasts, revisiting decisions they made and relationships they lost. They're exploring things that they could have done differently— regrettable mistakes, and random, buried memories. Like this guy who reminisced so much he landed on a years ago episode of Bear in the Big Blue House. Even just scrolling through old photos on Instagram can be tempting right now. Behavioral health specialists suspect this isn't a coincidence. Here's why so many people are revisiting their pasts in quarantine. The past can be grounding. For some, the past can also provide a sense of calm and stability that people aren't getting from their daily lives right now. There's a lot of uncertainty and instability ahead, and people may resort to the past to find peace. The past is very comforting. It's a known. It's human nature to make negative assumptions when we're faced with uncertainty. In this case, people may have doubts about what the future holds. Looking at the past is a way to regain some control in a situation that's making you feel helpless. Myra Mendez, a psychotherapist with Providence St. John's Child and Family Development Center in Santa Monica, California, added that looking back can help people understand how they once dealt with grief and uncertainty and that they can overcome difficulties yet again. Most people will realize they've had a great capacity for resilience, Mendez said. The past can also be grounding, she added. It validates our existence and gives our life meaning, especially in a time when there's so much instability. When you're grounded in your own existence, it stabilizes your thinking, your emotions, your ability to problem solve, and cognitively process information, Mendez said. Couldn't have said it better myself. It must have been around 1988 or maybe 1989. My sister and I had saved up our money and decided to pull it together so that we could purchase Nintendo. One day, our parents drove us to the local music and electronics store, called Coconuts. That's not made up. That is the name of the store that was once there. My sister has always been much better at saving her money than me, so she contributed well over, I would say, $100 to our cause, and I must have given maybe 20 or 30 bucks, maybe less. For the rest of the time that we had together, every once in a while, she would give me a hard time about it. Remember when I basically paid for all of Nintendo and you contributed like $5? Yes. Yes, Becky, I remember that. Thank you very much. Sisters, can't live with them, can't live without them. On today's episode, we'll be discussing the groundbreaking home entertainment system known as Nintendo, a gaming console that ruled the world of at-home video games for much of the late 1980s and early 1990s. Through our look back, you will learn the connection between Nintendo, the Walt Disney Company, and Popeye, of all people. We'll also touch on the Nintendo-inspired film, The Wizard. So pull up your beanbag chair and slap on your power glove. Here we go. Welcome and thank you for tuning into the Pop Culture Retrospective Podcast, a show dedicated to reliving pop culture memories, inspired, and memory of my sister. My name is Amy Lewis and I'm your host, and you are tuning into episode number five, Nintendo. The origins of Nintendo dates back all the way to 1889, believe it or not, in the ancient city of Kyoto, Japan. A man by the name of Fushihiro Yamauchi created beautiful handmade playing cards called Hanafuda, which, roughly translated, means flower cards in Japanese. He started a company called Nintendo Kampai. Nintendo roughly translates as leave luck to heaven, and Kampai is basically the equivalent of saying cheers in English. 
My grandmother is actually from Japan. She was born there. We call her Obachan. Every once in a blue moon, I think this has happened maybe once or twice in my life, I have seen her take a, a shot of sake. And when she does, she says kompai and, uh, and throws one back. So certainly a, a word with some happy meaning there. Eventually, the cards became so popular that Fusahiro had to hire staff and open a facility to keep up with demand. There were 12 suits of the cards, one for each month of the year. Instead of numbers on the cards, there were pictures. Fusahiro ran the company until about 1929. His son-in-law, Sakahiro Kanida, took over for the next 20 or so years. After 70 solid years of production, the cards became associated with gambling and gangsters known as Yakuza. Some members of the Yakuza even had tattoos of the Hanafuda. Because of this association, people in Japan didn't want to purchase these cards anymore. Around 1949-1950, I kind of read some conflicting information, uh, Fusahiro Yamauchi's great-grandson took over the company. His name was Hiroshi Yamauchi, and he was just 22 years old and was very ambitious. He wanted to move beyond just making playing cards. He wanted to transition into the toy industry. That would come eventually. Meanwhile, though, the Nintendo company continued to produce playing cards. In 1953, they became the first company in Japan to produce playing cards made out of plastic. Also interesting to learn in the late 1950s, Yamauchi met with Disney executives to work on a plan to license Disney characters on playing cards. The hope was that, through this partnership, perhaps the stigma of gambling and gangs would go by the wayside when customers saw the likes of Bambi and Thumper on their playing cards. This partnership proved to be a huge success. They sold over a half a million packs of the cards. Yamauchi was incredibly inspired by the Walt Disney Company because they were really and truly a global entertainment company at that point. Disneyland opened in 1955, and after working out some kinks like women's high heels getting stuck in the tar on Main Street and the water fountains not working, it actually became a huge success. Disney had an animation studio, a live action movie studio, merchandise, etc., Mickey Mouse had been a household name for decades by this point. Yamauchi then decided to change the Nintendo Kompai Company name to just Nintendo. In the mid-1960s, the Nintendo Company attempted to expand their brand via some pretty random ventures as the playing card industry was on a bit of a decline, to say the least. They ran a taxi company, a food company, a love hotel chain, and developed a remote-controlled vacuum called Chiratory. How you like them apples, Roomba? Yeah. In the 60s, they developed a remote-controlled vacuum. The Roomba didn't come out until 2002. Suck it, Roomba. Thankfully, in 1965, Nintendo hired a man by the name of Gonpai Yokoi, who would prove to be an asset in the progression of the company. Soon the Nintendo company began getting into the toy industry. They decided they could use the distribution channels they already had from the playing cards to dispense their new line of toys. The first toy they ever produced was called the Ultra Hand. It was designed by Gonpai Yokoi. It's an interesting story, actually, how that toy came to be. In 1966, Yamauchi was watching the manufacturing of the Hanafuda, and he saw something that caught his eye during that production he saw an extending hand that was aiding in the creation of the cards. Yamauchi told Kompai to please start immediately mass-producing these as a toy in time for the Christmas holiday. It was a huge success and sold over 1 million units. Yamauchi then pulled Yokoi off the assembly line and shifted him to product development. Kind of reminded me a bit of the movie Big, actually. He really saw something in Yokoi, and that was a very wise decision. Yokoi had a solid understanding of electrical engineering. This would help Nintendo to continue to progress. He would go on to develop several other electronic toys, including the precursor to the Nintendo Entertainment System toy gun that would eventually be used in Duck Hunt. In 1975, Nintendo started to develop home video game consoles. 
Their first one was called the Magnavox Odyssey, and later the Color TV Game 6. In 1977, Atari released the Atari 2600. This really popularized the use of separate cartridges for games instead of having them just built in. In 1978, Nintendo released a computer game version of the board game Othello. In 1979, Nintendo released some arcade games, which was becoming a huge industry at the time. They released a game called Radar Scope. Beginning in 1980, Nintendo released a handheld game watch, sort of like a calculator, called the Game and Watch, which was designed by Yokoi. It was made until 1991, actually, and sold over 43.3 million units. Unbelievable. In 1981, Nintendo developed Donkey Kong, which was designed by Shagahiro Miyamoto. Just before that, though, the company was asked to create an arcade game that was based off of Popeye, if you believe it, to coincide with a movie that was released in 1980. I completely forgot about the cartoon Popeye, as well as the live-action Popeye movie, which starred Robin Williams and Shelley Duvall. Uh, In case you don't know, Popeye is a sailor who gets his impressive strength from the help of cans of spinach. Don't we all? I had a can of spinach for dinner. No, I didn't. But anyways, the company ended up losing that license, but they were able to utilize some of that development into the Donkey Kong game. Bluto was a villain in Popeye, so that character became Donkey Kong. Olive Oil became Pauline the Princess, and the hero, Popeye, became Jumpman in the Japanese version, and later Mario in the American version. Mario, the video game character, was named after Mario Segal, who Nintendo rented a 60,000 square foot facility from beginning in the early 1980s. Some reports say that he was a bit hot-headed and quite the character. By 1982, arcade games generated $27 billion in revenue. $27 $27 billion. And just thinking about going to an arcade now and touching a joystick and buttons that everybody has been touching sounds like a really bad idea. But hey, in 1982, it was quite a big deal. There were approximately 60,000 arcade units at this peak in the United States. Home game console use earned about $14 billion that same year. Unfortunately, though, things changed very quickly. Just that next year, 1983, the year of my birth, the arcade industry started taking a serious nosedive. There were just too many developers developing too many games, and it became an issue of quantity over quality. Consumers were moving toward using computers at home. Making note of this, in 1983, the greatest year on record, Nintendo released a home video game console called the Famicom, which was short for family computer. In 1985, Nintendo showcased their new Nintendo Entertainment System, or NES, at the Consumer Electronics Show. The NES utilized cartridges, although initially when it was in development, the console was going to utilize floppy disks and a keyboard. Hiroshi Yamauchi thought that floppy disks and keyboards would be too intimidating to most people, which is a crazy thought in 2020. They drastically modified the Famicom design by having the game cartridges load in the front and not on the top. They wanted it to load more like a cassette player because people were getting more familiar with that and were more comfortable with that design. Later that same year, they began a slow rollout of the Nintendo Entertainment System via test markets in New York City and Los Angeles, and later San Francisco and Chicago. The full rollout happened in September of 1986, in the U.S. and parts of Europe were included. One key decision they made was to market Nintendo as a toy, not a video game or electronic, since consumers were starting to shift away from that. This marketing strategy, along with the quality of the games, resulted in Nintendo being a huge success. In Christmas of 1986 and 1987, Nintendo was the biggest seller. It cost about $140 or so when it was released, and it originally came with a robot named Rob the Robot Playmate. God, we missed the boat on that one. We did not have the robot. Ugh. Anyways. 
Soon, Nintendo blew Atari out of the water, and it took 65% of market share in 1988. Some of their most popular games for NES included Super Mario Bros. 1, 2, and 3, Duck Hunt, Legend of Zelda, which was absolutely my sister's favorite game, Dr. Mario, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Excite Bike, and Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. Some of the NES accessories that you may remember, Power Glove, which was released in 1989, it worked as a controller and motion detector. You could move your character by pushing buttons, turning your wrist, or moving your arm up and down. The Power Pad could be used for more movement-based games like World Class Track Meet, Dance Aerobic, and Athletic World. There was also the NES Advantage, which was a large game controller that had a joystick and two turbo knobs. One distinct memory I have about playing Nintendo, whether it was with my sister, friends, cousins, etc., was the infamous blowing of the cartridge. For some reason, everyone knew that if your game wasn't working right, the solution was to blow on the cartridge. How this word traveled around the world, I have no idea, but everybody did it. So apparently for 37 years, I've been living a lie because I did some research and uh, and found out that this is not effective, blowing on the cartridge, that is. In a video clip, which I will uh, add to the show notes, I learned that although we grew up believing that blowing across the bottom of the cartridge was perhaps clearing out dust to make the game work appropriately, that was not the case whatsoever. The website, the AV Club, did some research and learned that this is, in fact, a myth. Blowing on the cartridge doesn't actually do anything, and the liquid from your mouth that gets generated through the particles when you're breathing on it actually can do some damage to the game. The reason why the games worked after blowing on the cartridge had to do with the game getting reinserted and reconnecting, thus fixing any glitches. Mind blown. Mind blown. The article that went along with the clip on the AV Club site had this to say, Quote, something that a lot of people don't know is that blowing in your video game cartridges is actually bad because 80s kids were stupid and everything you believe is a lie. End quote. My sister and I had quite the system of blowing on the cartridge, moving the little shelf thingamajig up and down to make it work, and uh, even blowing inside of the Nintendo system to fix any technical problems. So apparently... We actually were, in fact, stupid. Thanks, AV Club. The peak of Nintendo seemed to coincide with the 1989 release of the cult classic film The Wizard, starring America's sweetheart, Mr. Fred Savage, along with other well-known names at the time, including Christian Slater, Bo Bridges, and Jenny Lewis, who you may remember was in True Beverly Hills. You know, gather round you, friends of mine. We're wilderness girls and it's cookie time. That will be the subject of another show. And I will refrain from singing the rest of the cookie song. Anyways, it tells the story of two brothers who travel to California on a bit of an adventure, if you will. Fred Savage plays the character of Corey, whose younger brother Jimmy is in a psychiatric facility due to his PTSD which resulted from losing his twin sister in a tragic accident. Corey is very frustrated that his parents did this, so within what seems like the first five to ten minutes of the movie, he schemes up a plan to run away with his little brother. In an early scene, he looks at the address of the facility his brother is in on a scrap piece of paper, and then throws a dart at a United States map he has hanging in his room. It lands on a few different places, and then it finally lands on California. He decides that is where they should go. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. When I'm trying to plan a vacation with my family, when there's not a coronavirus outbreak, I just throw a dart at the United States map. It works perfectly. Soon he sneaks into the facility, gets his brother, and they set off on quite the adventure involving riding in the back of a hostess truck, skateboarding without helmets on in front of semi-trucks no less, video games, and a soundtrack that includes songs by the new kids on the block. Corey befriends a girl at the bus station, her name is Haley, who is played by Jenny Lewis, who we talked about, 
Uh, she is on her way home to Reno, Nevada. Long story short, Haley ends up missing her bus, and they all end up sort of stuck together, unsure of what to do next. Corey and Haley realize that Jimmy has an incredible knack for video games, and thus he is dubbed the wizard. They eventually learn that there is a video game contest at Universal Studios in Hollywood, California. The prize is $50,000, and Haley and Corey figure that, you know, if Jimmy can show how talented of a game player he is, perhaps his parents will reconsider keeping him an institution. They spend the next few weeks going from state to state, earning money by sort of hustling people with video game competitions against Jimmy. Corey will approach people who kind of look like some suckers and uh, encourages them to challenge his little brother, who is young and quiet, so most agree to the battle, but of course they end up losing. In this movie, there is quite a bit of Nintendo product placement, which the movie kind of got some flack for. And some of that product placement included Corey's older brother, played by Christian Slater. He conveniently happens to have a Nintendo in the back of his dad's pickup truck, which he plays when they stop at hotels uh, and when they stop to get their car repaired because they end up going from state to state also to look for the missing boys. The dad also becomes addicted to playing video games. There's a scene in which the trio sees the previously mentioned Nintendo accessory, the Power Glove, in action when Jimmy is looking to play Nintendo against Lucas Barton, who's kind of a bully character. He happens to have all 97 Nintendo games that were available at the time. He shows his skills with the Nintendo and the Power Glove on a car racing game, and at the end, he raises the gloved hand against his black trench coat collar and says, I love the Power Glove. It's so bad. Okay. Jimmy is very intimidated by Lucas's video game prowess and decides not to play against him. Toward the end of the movie, we also get the first glimpse of Super Mario Bros. 3, as that's the game that Jimmy plays in the contest. I remember feeling so excited when I saw that reveal for the first time. It's pretty dramatic and very 80s. Uh, Mario 3 was really unlike any game that we had played before, me and my sister. The movie also features the song Send Me an Angel by the band Real Life, which I play often. I'm not kidding. The song is utilized during a montage scene where we see the kids hitching a ride on motorcycles with some Hell's Angels, holding up cardboard signs asking for a ride to Reno, adults on the hunt to find them, etc. This song was also used in the 1986 film Rad, starring a young Lori Laughlin. During a sequence in which her character and the main character, Crew, are at what appears to be a school dance, bust out their BMX bikes for a slow motion trick demonstration in front of a large crowd of people who have circled around them. It's so 80s and so glorious. You should check it out. I'll make sure to post a clip of that scene uh, in the show notes. God, I wish my prom could have been more like that. Prom sucked. Anyways, back to Nintendo. Seemingly out of nowhere, a company called Sega released Sega Genesis in 1989, and that's when the now long-running competition dubbed the Console Wars began. This sort of marked the beginning of the end of the NES home video game reign. Not so much, you know, Nintendo per se, but just that specific console. Sega tried to market themselves as being a bit kind of tougher and more extreme than Nintendo. There was an old commercial that I will also um, put in the show notes that I totally forgot about until I rewatched it. And uh, the song that plays along with it is Genesis does. You can't do this on Nintendo. And it would show, you know, the more complicated, detailed, perhaps more violent uh, games that you could play on Sega and how, you know, Nintendo, they were kind of trying to portray them as being a little bit more, I guess, lame for lack of a better term. Uh, following Sega Genesis, Nintendo released Super Nintendo, Game Boy, Virtual Boy, which was a huge flop, but everyone was really into virtual reality at this time, including my dad. That's a subject for another show. Uh, Nintendo 64, GameCube, PlayStation, Xbox came out from other companies, etc., etc. Later came Wii, Wii Fit, Wii U, etc. Although the NES didn't reign supreme forever, it is clear what an impact that system had. 
it really laid the groundwork for all the other video game consoles that came after it. The Nintendo Entertainment System sold 62 million units in its lifetime. The extent of me and my sister's video game playing stopped after we had a Sega for a few years, so my knowledge about video games is quite dated, to say the least, but I really loved revisiting the small window of time when my sister and I actually played video games. However, I did learn that gaming is up 75% since the pandemic. It's still extremely popular and is probably helping a lot of people get through this crazy, crazy time. I hope you've enjoyed this look back on the Nintendo Entertainment System, the most popular gaming system of the late 1980s and early 1990s. The Nintendo company went from making playing cards to the gambling controversy to remote-controlled vacuums to toys, and then, of course, went on to be the trailblazer for all future gaming systems. If you are enjoying the Pop Culture Retrospective podcast, please consider subscribing on whichever podcast platform you use. Please also rate the show on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. It really helps the show out a lot. And thank you to those who have already done that. I really appreciate it. Also, I have been meaning to make a correction on a previous show. Um, On the My So-Called Life episode, I mistakenly said that my family took a road trip from L.A. to Anaheim, and it took several hours. They're actually not that far apart. I meant to say that our road trip was from San Francisco to Anaheim, which was very far. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you're welcome to email me at popcultureretrospective at gmail.com, or you can tweet me. I have a Twitter for the first time ever and um, kind of getting used to it, but uh, you can tweet me at popcultureretro. I hope you will join me for our next show where we will be discussing one of the most iconic rappers of the late 1980s and early 1990s, Mr. M.C. Hammer. I mean... What could be more perfect during a pandemic than to discuss an artist whose most famous hit was Can't Touch This? I think I have been unconsciously saying slash singing this to my small children since mid-March. When they reach for a railing, I say, you can't touch this. Or a door handle located anywhere other than in our house. You can't touch this. Anyways, until then, be kind, be safe, and hold on to your memories.